So <clears throat> it's a homecoming of sorts for me, although I haven't spent as much time at Oxford as I would like. Um, when 1972 to 73, my father was on sabbatical at Oxford, and we lived in Whiteham Abbey, which is just a, a, a few miles away. I'm hoping to return there tomorrow. And in the backyard, uh, I used to play soccer all the time with my uh, brothers. And I, I think this was the first scientific problem I thought about. I was going, how does this happen, right? And I'm going, are, are there air fluctuations? How could this possibly be? Because sometimes if you hit a ball with no spin whatsoever, it'll flutter around. And so I go, mm, how does that work? Interesting. Don't know. That's an another. Another problem I thought about was this one, as everyone would. And here we see an example of an early hydrodynamic quantum analog. More of these later. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll st I wasn't interested in the melting point of cesium or the standard model. I was interested in trying to understand what I saw around me. So I thought, maybe I'll go study physics. So I studied physics. And uh, during my physics, four years of physics, I took zero course in fluid dynamics. So I had still had no idea why a soccer ball bent, why a stone skipped. But I took six courses in quantum mechanics, where we really weren't encouraged to try and understand what we saw around us. Instead, we were invited to wallow in the mysteries of quantum mechanics. So that drew, uh, drove me to fluid mechanics. And turns out that in the States, fluid mechanics is represented primarily in engineering departments or happily applied math departments. And if this is your guiding light, if you dig deeply enough into any physical system, you find mathematics. For example, here in the heart of the sunflower, uh, if you count the number of swirls going clockwise and counterclockwise, you always find adjacent numbers in the Fibonacci sequence, which is 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. And <clears throat> so you can, of course, find mathematics anywhere, whether it's in the heart of the sunflower or on the pavement stone outside. Um, you, uh, there, you're therefore pretty much free to study anything you want. So I have specialized in surface tension. So this is a feature of an interface. So if we imagine an air-water interface, um, <clears throat> we know that within the bulk of a fluid, there's a force per unit area, so-called pressure. We can think of uh, surface tension as imparting an effective uh, <coughs> surface pressure. So a tensile force per unit length along the interface. And as a result, you can uh, small objects can float on the surface of water, even if they're heavy relative to the water. So here we have a paper clip suspended by surface tension. Likewise for um, water striders, these small insects. And the, um, <clears throat> if there are gradients in surface tension, because it's a force per unit length, you generate interfacial forces which can drag things along. So this is a cocktail boat full of alcohol. Alcohol leaks out the back. Turns out surface tension is a function of alcohol. It decreases with alcohol concentration, so the boat is then pulled along by the surface tension gradient. Okay? And so these are the two main uh, physical features of surface tension. And mathematically, in fluid dynamics, you're basically just solving uh, Newton's law. So um, mass times acceleration equals the sum of the forces. In your, but you're writing this down for every, for a, um, every infinitesimal blob within the fluid. So um, <clears throat> this is your mass times acceleration term. This is the inertial term. And the for the, so a blob of fluid moves in response to pressure gradients, gravity, and viscous stresses. And surface tension enters into the boundary condition. So when you have an interface, there's a jump in pressure, which is proportional to the surface tension and the curvature of the interface. And again, we can generate uh, tangential stresses if there are gradients in surface tension as arise through chemical gradients, as we've seen, or temperature gradients. Okay, so that's the basic math. These are the equations. The beauty of, of fluid mechanics is these are the only equations you ever have to worry about. Okay, they're a mess. That's the downside. Um, and so, why is it that we go through our lives and many of us never even know what surface tension is? I went through, of course, my undergraduate. Actually, I went into fluid mechanics. I went in through geophysics, and so after my PhD, I really didn't know what surface tension was. But um, this is because it's important on a small scale. Okay. So it's, uh, if you have a blob of fluid, we know that we take a bucket of fluid, we pour it on the ground, we get a thin uh, puddle. Basically, its extent is, is uh, prescribed by surface tension. If we have a small drop, it'll just sit there. So you basically have gravity trying to drive you outwards. So there's a hydrostatic pressure, which is rho g a, if the a is the characteristic scale of our blob. 
surface tension wants to minimize the surface area, so it's acting, it, it, it wants to maintain the sphericity of the blob of fluid. So there's a balance between these two, and when you have a large uh, volume of fluid, it will spread again out to a puddle. If it's small, surface tension wins, and it um, maintains its sphericity. So basically, the relative magnitudes of these two forces, gravity acting to cause spreading, surface tension to resist it, is prescribed by the bond number. And so if there's a critical length, which is so-called capillary length, below which surface tension wins relative to gravity. Okay, and so then, again, we're in this scenario. And so this capillary length is about two millimeters, and coincidentally, this is the scale which sets the size of raindrops. Okay, okay so surface tension dominates the world of insects and microfluidics, which is why it's been enjoying a resurgence in the engineering community. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is walking on water in the biological sphere. So it turns out um, many creatures have learned to walk on water for various reasons, in particular for foraging on the surface, avoiding predators. So this is throughout, so you have insects, spiders, uh, reptiles, birds, and even mammals that can uh, support themselves on the water surface. And so I thought to uh, try and classify how they actually do it. So again, surface tension is important for small creatures. So uh, it, you can have static weight support if the object is small enough. So it turns out all biological creatures are slightly heavy relative to water. So wood, if submerged, sink. But uh, they use surface tension to stay afloat. So again, there's a ratio of the weight of the object relative to the surface tension force generated by its deflecting the interface. And if this is less than one, the object can stand uh, at rest on the interface, as does this water strider, which is about a centimeter long. Large objects, such as the lizard, uh, can't reside at rest. They would sink unless they hammer the surface with their feet. Okay, so you can basically divide creatures into small and large. Again, small being their world is dominated by surface tension. So these small creatures are, are above the sort of, uh, this is the, point at which you fall through the interface. So small creatures reside, can reside at rest. The larger creatures rely on dynamic weight support. Okay, So we can then say, OK, statics is easy. How do they actually propel themselves? And I think this is kind of constructive. So this is the mathematician's view of a water walking creature. It's a sphere with characteristic size A, uh, cross-sectional area, capital A, and it's hitting the surface at speed u. So you can ask what forces it can use to contribute to its lateral propulsion. So you have a, a buoyancy term simply because there is a hydrostatic pressure across which it can push it when it generates a cavity. Then there's a form drag, and this is just the, the force you feel when you stick your hand out of a car door, so it's proportional to your uh, speed squared times the area of your hand. Then there's a, basically an added mass term. You have a viscous term. Then you have the surface tension terms. Okay, So these guys, again, the interface behaves like a trampoline, so it's conceivable that insects could use this to uh, bounce off the surface. And then we have the possibility of surface tension gradients propelling bugs. And so um, if, you, if all of these terms are important, uh, things are going to be a mess. Um, and so really what you want to do is um, <coughs> simplify things to the point that you can get some insight into what's going on. I think what's interesting, if you ask the question, which force are used by which creature, every single force is used by some creature. So there's some sort of principle suggesting any mechanism that can promote life will be exploited by nature. Okay, so here, here are some of the big guys uh, <clears throat> that uh, don't use, can't use surface tension. So these guys are about that long, and they have to run at about 15 meters per second to do this. But they're slapping the surface, generating a cavity, pushing across the back. So they're using form drag and hydrostatic pressures to drive themselves along. And here's a new one. By the way, how do I mute this? Okay, there we go. It doesn't mute. There's some override. Okay, so here's another one. They can walk on water. Perfect. Yeah, right. Okay, so there we go. The skittering frog. So that's sort of at the cusp. Um, it's too big for surface tension, but it uses it to a certain extent. And now we have smaller objects. So these uh, water striders stroke the surface and throw water backwards in the form of vortices. And so there was a paradox saying that these things couldn't move. 
again, another theme of this talk is paradoxes. When you see paradoxes in a field, you um, or put off the problem because people explain to you in your field how to think about something in the wrong way. So when I was a student, I was exp uh, my supervisor explained to me why I should never work on certain problems in fluid dynamics um, because they were so hard. And then I have subsequently seen some of them resolved. And I said, well, why didn't I look at that? So I really think paradoxes should be an invitation to work on a problem, not the converse. In biology, there are lots of paradoxes. For example, there was um, I think it was Gray's paradox, which says that a dolphin can't swim as quickly as it does. And you say, well, what was that based on? And so they did a, an experiment in which they took a, 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 a plaster cast of a dolphin and dragged it behind a boat and found that it had um, anomalously high drag. So, of course, one might conclude that flexibility is important. So, in their other paradoxes, saying that a bumblebee can't fly. And of course, we know it can. So, I think working biology was useful in pointing out. When they're paradoxes in a, in a field, it's because people in that field are looking at things the wrong way. Okay, so this is a, so this is a photo of these uh, water striders, which we just saw, and the sort of vortical wake, wake of the water strider. So we basically sprinkle the surface with a blue dye, and uh, this is the pattern it leaves behind. Um, it turns out that we gave it a yellow brush to give it a, a little bit of Van Gogh. All right. And so here's another creature that uses surface tension for propulsion. It basically arches its back in order to um, <clears throat> match the curvature of the meniscus, which it's trying to climb. So it's trying to climb a meniscus from right to left. And it does so, again, just by arching its back. And so it's basically releasing surface energy as it climbs. And here's another one, which uses the um, Cheerios Vela effect, as it's come to be known. So we, uh, it basically distorts the interface, pulls up on the interface, and uh, climbs upwards. So again, it's acting to minimize the surface energy of the system. OK, uh, and here's one that uses the Marangoni forces, basically dumps a uh, lipid onto the surface. This changes the surface tension and propels it towards the shore. So it's not a very efficient uh, mechanism, but this is used by something which, is, which uh, doesn't tr uh, habitually walk on water. It's a, again, it's an emergency. Uh, propulsion device. Okay, so those are the things that walk on water. And so we basically classified all such creatures. Um, and you can see, again, all of the mechanisms available to, to water walking creatures are used by some creature. And which uh, me mechanism they use is determined by their size. Okay, and so, <clears throat> so I was happily working on this sort of thing. And then suddenly, Yves Couder introduced me to the following problem. So <coughs> this was, uh, so part two, that was just a preamble, an excuse to show some nice videos. But so the problem, this is nice in that it took me back to my roots in physics and my frustration with physics. Okay, and so we're taught in, uh, as undergraduates, that the universe is sort of inhomogeneous on a, in a philosophical sense. That is to say, the macroscopic world is deterministic. You have particles following trajectories described by Newton's laws. If you have the initial conditions, you can predict the outcome. So quantum physics, we are taught, uh, conversely, that the microscopic world is intrinsically probabilistic. So particle trajectories are not described, only the statistics. So you can only predict the uh, probability of a particular outcome in a quantum system. Okay, and of course, there are those that uh, <coughs> dissented, um, Einstein in particular, his most famous a dictum is this, saying God does not play dice. But what he really objected to was the concept of quantum non-locality, which is to say superluminal signaling. So, of course, having derived, uh, developed relativity, this was anathema to him. And that will be another theme of this talk today. OK, and so, so we're going to see how non-local behavior can be misinferred from a local hereditary system. OK, let me dig into that a little bit. So. Hidden variable theories are theories which uh, seek a rational dynamics underlying quantum statistics. So we know that quantum mechanics correctly predicts the statistical behavior of microscopic systems. But what's the dynamics? That's really uh, still an outstanding question. So if we were to characterize these hidden variables, so that's to say those variables that would uh, describe the trajectory of microscopic particles, we could then um, restore our rationality to the microscopic physics. Okay, so um, a brief history. It turns out that all the uh, most of the attempts—I shouldn't say all 
attempts to uh, come up with the rational dynamics have been based on a, the notion of a pilot wave theory, where you have a particle moving in concert with, its, with a guiding wave. Okay? And so De Bruy in 1926 proposed a, a double wave, pilot wave theory of quantum dynamics. So again, so it's a particle moving in resonance with a guiding wave. Um, and then this sort of sense of, and on the basis of which he drives several things, in per particular P equals H bar K, a number of the cornerstones of quantum mechanics, the einstein de Bruy relation, which we'll come to late, later. And on the basis of his physical picture, Schrodinger derived Schrodinger's equation and also Klein-Gordon. Um, and so really the, it motivated the development of the mathematical formulation of quantum mechanics. Nevertheless, this physical picture was discarded in favor of nothing. Okay, so, and this is a quite sensible view, suffered a setback when von Neumann in 1932 was alleged to have proven that there could be no hidden variable theory. Um, and this, Bohm then, and that stood for about 20 years until David Bohm presented a single wave pilot wave theory, which was consistent with the predictions of quantum mechanics. Um, it has some difficulties, again, some of which were pointed out by Joe Keller. But um, this Bell, uh, Bohm's contribution was important because it attracted John Bell, who subsequently went through and discredited the impossibility proofs and was led to the uh, following conclusion. Okay, and so I'm going to come back and talk a little about Bell's theorem at the end. Okay, and so fast forward now, almost a century. In 2005, Yves Couder discovered a hydrodynamic pilot wave system. It's really a macroscopic realization of the sort of mechanics that De Bruy had imagined. Okay? And lo and behold, it exhibits uh, several features of quantum systems that were thought to be exclusive to the microscopic quantum realm. In particular, the statistical behavior of this macroscopic classical system looks very much like that of quantum systems in certain cases. Okay, so the question's raised, what are the key dynamical features responsible for this quantum-like behavior? What are the potential limitations of this hydrodynamic system as a quantum analog? And the big question that I want to address today is might memory account for quantum non-locality? Okay. okay, so <clears throat> if we zoom a little in, a little deeper into classical physics, we had the uh, Laplacian view of the universe. If you have the governing equations and the initial conditions, you can predict its outcome. It's like a record being played. Uh, we know what's going to happen for all time. We realize that predictability in classical systems, if they're sufficiently complex, is limited um, because complex systems, are, their behavior is sensitive to initial conditions. Okay? So <clears throat> there are practical limitations to predictability even in classical systems. More complicated still are hereditary systems. So these are systems in which which are uh, in which uh, the system evolution is dependent on its history. Okay, so a classic example is elastic solids, where you have the state of instantaneous uh, state of stresses determined by the history of strain. But we'll we'll uh, see how this comes up in the hydrodynamic case. But basically, in order to predict the future, you have to know not only the initial conditions but the system's past. Okay, so this is a very rich um, class of dynamical systems, and we see in this particular one, the bouncing droplet system, which we'll come to now, uh, local hereditary mechanics, that is to say, spatially local hereditary mechanics can give rise to apparently non-local behavior. Okay, so this is the system. We have a vibrating bath of fluid. Again, if you go on my webpage, you can see how to do this with $60, for $60. So um, we have a bath about this big. We drive it around 50 hertz. The amplitude of vibration is around a millimeter. So you have the vibrational acceleration, um, and the control parameter is the ratio of that to gravity. And so when the vibrational acceleration exceeds a, a value which is around uh, 4G, you get a standing field of subharmonic Faraday waves. That is to say they have half the frequency of the driving. And the theory of this was done by Brooke Benjamin uh, in a beautiful paper, Benjamin and Ursel. Okay. So, um, and it turns out uh, if you have this vibrating bath, you can levitate drops. Okay, so this drop is about one millimeter across. We're driving around 50 hertz, so it's a fluid which is a little more viscous than water. Um, and effectively, the interface behaves like a trampoline because of surface tension, and there's no coalescence because the thin air layer doesn't have time to drain during the impact. Okay. 
So this thing, again, is bouncing 50 times per second. And remarkably, what Couder Eve discovered uh, by accident, actually, is that it, there's this corner of parameter space where these drops, bouncing drops, become unstable to translational motion. So if you look carefully, you can see that this thing is actually landing on the side of its wave. So each time it lands, it gets a horizontal impulse. So it's being slowly nudged from left to right. Okay? So a key feature of this system is the resonance between the particle and the wave. Okay? And, um, and this object, which you've called a walker, which we've now uh, called the Kudair walker in his honor, is a particle dressed in a wave. Right? And so this concept of a particle moving in its own wave field is throughout physics, but the theoretical treatment thereof is generally limited, even in electromagnetism, the Lorentz-Dirac equation, which, is, which tries to describe a charge moving in its own electromagnetic field, has runaway solutions. Here we have a particle dressed in a wave. We can see the particle. We can see the wave. We can see the dynamics on the scale of the vibration. Okay? And so, again, the system is non-Markovian. So I, say, I just introduced the term uh, hereditary. It's the instantaneous force which it gets during impact depends on the local slope of the wave field. So it's a local, uh, local in space. The whole system, of course, is local, it's classical. But in order to get that slope, you have to integrate backwards in time to take into account all of the waves generated in the past, right? So this is, we can think in terms of path memory, as Eve called it. And so the extent of the hereditary dynamics, so the, the importance of memory is determined by how close you are to the Faraday threshold. So at the Faraday threshold, uh, again, you excite waves even in the absence of the drop. We're always doing experiments below the Faraday threshold, so there would be no waves in the absence of the drop, but it locally generates Faraday waves which are damped in time. As you approach the Faraday threshold, these waves are uh, more persistent, and so you have to integrate further backwards in time to predict the behavior of the system. Okay, okay so now it's more clear. If we strobe this, we grab one frame per bounce, and you can see it being pushed along by its guiding wave. And this is exactly the physical picture that De Bruyne had. He said particles move along uh, they move through a resonant interaction with their own wave field along a line of constant phase. And that's precisely what we have here. Okay, and so we've derived the, math, uh, the equations describing um, <clears throat> the dynamics. So we just have a mass times acceleration term. There's a drag term induced by flight and impact on the surface. And th this is the interesting term. So this is the wave force term. And this is the, this, so this depend, it's, there's a force proportional to the gradient of the fluid depth, and so the wave field we can get by summing up the waves generated by each impact, and these look something like damped Bessel functions. The form isn't too important, but you see how memory, the memory parameter is basically uh, an indication of the proximity to the Faraday threshold. So as the, this is the vibrational acceleration, as that approaches that, this thing gets large, okay? And that's basically a damping time, and that's the Faraday period. Okay, so again, you have this uh, trajectory equation, and now in the limit where the vertical dynamics is fast relative to the horizontal dynamics, you can uh, <clears throat> approximate this infinite sum by an integral, and you have a nice integral differential equation that you can analyze. In particular, you can look for uh, a static uh, solution, you can look for circular orbital solutions, steady walking solutions, and assess their stability. So we've done this in um, various settings. So if we go back um, and look at the static state, so you can form crystals of these bouncing drops. So we've looked at the stability of these states, uh, the pairs which just came out, um, and we're looking at uh, lattices. So it's r really quite rich mathematically. There's a lot to be done. Um, and also their dynamic bound states where the drops are adjoined by their uh, common pilot wave field. So here we see them locking into circular orbits. And here we see them moving um, in this fashion. So if this looks completely bizarre, it's because we've strobed, and we've strobed slightly off the bouncing frequency, so they appear to be sort of gliding in and out. OK, so um, and here's, a, so here's something done by Stuart Thompson, who is a recent graduate of, uh, of this department, who's currently an instructor in our department. So he looked at uh, an annular ring of bouncers, and as you cross the Faraday, sorry, not the Faraday threshold, a critical uh, dynamic threshold, you generate a, a um, solitary wave which propagates around the ring. 
and this is really a realization of a total lattice, which is a model of crystal vibrations. So you get uh, some sort of <clears throat> some nice mathematical connections to solid state physics. This is now a free ring, so the drops are free to move anywhere. In certain regimes, they'll move radially. Here we see this, bu this binary oscillation of two lattices. And uh, so what's going to happen here? 10 drops, 20 drops. Any, where's your money? Where's your money? Oh. OK, so these, we haven't predicted that one yet. No, may never. But OK, so if we go back to uh, single drops, uh, now if we look at their motion in various force fields, so now we have a drop moving in a rotating frame. So this was first looked at uh, in Eve's group. Uh, you expect if a drop moves, sorry, if a particle moves at uniform speed in a rotating frame, that it will follow an inertial orbit where you have a balance between the uh, centripetal outwards force and the inwards Coriolis force. Um, and this is what, so you basically expect the radius of the orbit to decrease with rotation rate. That's what happens at low memory when the wave field is not particularly important. As you go to high memory, as is the case here, you see the drops has to navigate its own wave field. So it's basically exciting a potential. <clears throat> and it's only stable in the troughs of this wave field. As a result, there's a quantization of the orbits. Okay, so there, you have quantized orbits who, where the quantization length is the Faraday wavelength. Okay, and so owing to the identical form of the uh, Coriolis force acting on a mass m in a uniformly rotating frame, and the Lorentz force acting on a charge Q in a uniform magnetic field, you can draw the analogy between these inertia, quantized inertial orbits and uh, Larmor levels. Here, the quantization length is again the Faraday wavelength. That's pl playing the role of the de Bray length in the quantum system. Okay, and Eve also looked at um, the uh, motion of a drop in a central uh, simple harmonic oscillator potential, so uh, basically a spring force. So the drop wants to move in a straight line, but it's also being constrained by the spring force, so it basically gets dragged back towards the center. Or, so there are various possibilities, and it turns out, so, so this is the radius of the orbit, which is a proxy for the energy of the system. Then you have the angular momentum, and so you actually get a double quantization, which is reminiscent of that in quantum mechanics. So here we see circular orbits. Here we have uh, these lemniscates, which have zero angular momentum. Then we have more elaborate uh, trifoils and so forth. And so you see as this, um, and we've seen in, in this and other systems, you have these quantized periodic orbits. And when the system becomes chaotic, they basically switch between them, giving rise to uh, sort of multimodal quantum-like statistics. Okay. And so so I'm not going to uh, dwell on the orbital dynamics, but I think it's quite well understood. And you see that the statistics of chaotic pilot wave systems can look very much like those of quantum mechanics. Okay? So we see that the quantization arises because of the dynamic constraint imposed on the droplet by its monochromatic wave field. So the fact that you have a resonance between the drop and the wave is key, because that ensures the monochromatic nature of its wave field. And again, when the system becomes chaotic, um, it switches between unstable periodic orbits. Okay? And this notion of a drop surfing its self-generated potential is important. Okay? And we'll come back to that later. Okay, and so my first contribution on this was to address the one problem I remembered from my undergraduate course in quantum courses in quantum mechanics, and it's, which is particle in a box. Okay? So it was Wonderful to come back to this problem because they've now been done experimentally. The other thing I didn't like about my training in quantum mechanics is they didn't compare their theory to experiments. Um, here's one where they have. So these are electrons zipping along on the surface of metal and the electron C inside, so there are some 20 or 30 electrons I think inside, are confined by, this, by these uh, uh, atoms. <clears throat> So they're bouncing around, and the waves you see there are basically the probability density functions. So these, um, <clears throat> you basically solve Helmholtz equation or uh, stationary Schrodinger equation, and you solve for the modes of the cavity. Okay, and the wavelength you see there is the de Bray wavelength. Okay, and so I said, oh, can we do that with walkers? Surely not. Okay, 
And the student who did this, Dan Harris, is outstanding experimentalist. I want you to note one thing. As the thing moves along, you see it's speed varying. So the, the trajectory is color coded according to speed. And you actually see speed variations on the Faraday wavelength. Okay, so this is a sort of classic feature of the system, which we're, the importance of which we're beginning to explore now. So you let the thing run and run and run. It's a very chaotic uh, motion, but you see the emergence of statistics, which look very much like those in the quantum system. Okay, so we see here, uh, and this looks here, the PDF looks like the amplitude of the Faraday mode of the cavity, but you see more, again, a sort of a recurring theme is how coherent wave-like statistics can emerge from chaotic pilot wave dynamics. Okay, and so here we have, we've revisited this uh, with an elliptical corral, so Pedro Sainz has done this, uh, and it's a very robust result. Um, here we see a speed map, and you see that they're basically, uh, the speed, the mean speed is a function of position, and it's because of this uh, dependence that the one has the emerging quantum-like statistics. And in this study, we noticed something interesting, which is that the, we actually measured the mean wave field. So if the instantaneous wave field at any instant doesn't look like the wave mode of the cavity, but the average wave field does. So this is the particle histogram. This is the average wave field. And you can see they take precisely the same form. So then we proved that this average wave field can be expressed as uh, the convolution of the bouncer wave field, so that's the wave field you get if the drop is just bouncing in place, and the histogram. So this particle is effectively navigating the mean wave field of the cavity, and this mean wave field of the cavity depends on the statistical behavior. So it's a very strange potential, right? So you have this drop, again, surfing a background wave whose form depends on its statistics. Okay, and this is a sort of uh, confusion which arises in Bohmian mechanics, which we can see our way around now, okay? And this, and this potential, if you like, again, it is non-local. It is basically imposed by the statistics. Okay, so it's non-local in the same way that the quantum potential is non-local in Bohmian mechanics. Okay, and so we can then see in uh, standard quantum mechanics, you solve for the modes of the cavity, and what do they actually do in comparing to experiments? They just choose, they put, they, it's a superposition of modes, and they are free to choose the coefficients on those modes. So in our system, we say, okay, we could do the same, or we could say there's actually an underlying dynamics, and we can think of this underlying dynamics as, be, as uh, being <clears throat> a, a trajectory in which, which can be decomposed into various component parts, in particular periodic subtrajectories, and the thing, the drop is actually jumping between them. And uh, most importantly, we see here that the notion of trajectory is not inconsistent with the emergent emergence of quantum statistics in this system, okay? And so, um, <clears throat> at a more general level, the system has three scales, at least. There are actually more, but um, we can think of it in terms of three time scales. So we have the time scale of wave generation, which is the time scale of vibration of the particle, effectively. Then you have this pilot wave dynamics, which is uh, revealed by strobing at the bouncing frequency, okay? And then you have this long-term statistical behavior emerging, okay? There's actually, so again, if you like asymptotics there, there's a huge range of timescales in this problem because there's a timescale of emergence of the mean pilot wave, there's a timescale of emergence of the statistics, and of course the dynamical timescales as well. Okay, so um, what does this remind us of? Well, it turns out it's very similar to De Bruy's mechanics. So this is what uh, Frank Wilczek calls a poem in two lines. This is uh, the Einstein-De Broglie relation. So relativity requires this. Quantum mechanics requires this. If you equate the two, you see that a particle of ma mass m must have a natural frequency. This is the so-called Compton frequency. Uh, it's the frequency of the Zitterbewegung, as they call it, uh, in the early days of quantum mechanics. And De Broglie said that this was the frequency of oscillation of a particle. Um, and there's at this energy, at, sorry, at this frequency, there's an exchange between rest mass energy and field energy. Again, this basically being rest mass energy, this being field energy. So, so you said particles are oscillators with this high <coughs> frequency. They're then generating a wave and riding that wave. And then somehow 
you, it will give rise to quantum statistics, okay? But so notice that there are two waves in his theory. There's the uh, wave centered on the particle, which is pushing it around, and then there's the emergent statistical form, okay? And that's very much like ours. And so there we have the psi, which is the standard uh, wave in quantum mechanics, but then you have the particle-centered de Breuil wave, okay? And this is generated by the particle vibration at this Compton frequency, and he said that the waves are solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation, so that's just the uh, relativistic form of uh, Schrodinger's equation. It's actually very nice because it looks very much like the water wave equation. Um, and so from this formulation, he said particles move perpendicular to surfaces of constant phase. So that, and that from that, if you have a monochromatic wave, it gives you this p equals h bar k. So the particles riding along a line of constant phase. And the other thing that he stressed in his theory was this harmony of phases. So the uh, particle oscillates in resonance with its guiding wave. So there you have to consider the fact you have a moving clock, but its frequency is prescribed by its mass. And so the two cancel beautifully. And he thought that he called this un grand loi de la nature. He thought this was a very important point, and it's critical in our system, the resonance between the particle and its wave. Okay. And so really he imagined something very close to what we have now in the lab. Uh, you have a high frequency oscillation at the Compton frequency. You have an intermediate pilot wave dynamics in which the particle surfs along its guiding wave and explores its uh, background potential. Um, and then you have the emergent long-term statistics described by standard quantum theory. So what he was unable to do was to show how this would emerge from this. And of course, the question arises, what is the pilot wave? And um, so there are those who, the sort of, I would say, the modern extensions of de Broglie's mechanics have looked to the electromagnetic quantum vacuum. This is uh, nice in that um, it it's, has a spectral form which has h bar in it. So the energy in a, so basically you just have electromagnetic background noise, which is then interacts with the uh, particle. But it, so the energy in a mode with frequency omega is h bar omega over two. So the idea then is that the uh, <clears throat> object interacts with this background field, generates a pilot wave, and off you go. And you can think of it in terms of uh, if you have a turbulent fluid and you throw a spring into the turbulent fluid, it will start oscillating at its natural frequency. It will pump energy into the fluid at that frequency. So in some sense, the particle only talks with that component of the field which has the right frequency, the Compton frequency in this case. Okay, and so then you can do a map and notice, I mean, it has the, the right number of variables, which is beautiful. If, if you draw the map between de Broglie's mechanics, complemented by SED, and the Walker system. Um, <clears throat> so again, the bouncing is playing the role of this Zitterbewegung, this high frequency oscillation. In de Broglie's mechanics, you have this, uh, the harmony of phases is, is assured by this resonance condition in our system. Um, surface tension basically plays the role of h-bar because we have capillary waves. This is the wave parameter in quantum mechanics. The, uh, in all of the analogs we've seen, um, the Faraday wavelength is playing the role of the de Broglie wavelength. But there's a second wavelength in uh, de Broglie's mechanics, which is the Compton wavelength. So this is basically the scale of vibration. And so uh, in our system, it's basically this length, so the length, the step length in the bouncing. And of course, if you strobe over it, that thing's gone, just like all consideration of the Compton length is gone if you go from uh, relativistic mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics to non-relativistic. Okay. okay, and so we can play a few games here. So we know that this system is driven. So basically, so in terms of, the, I should mention the energetic. So this system is, of course, driven, and that's then playing the role of the quantum vacuum in uh, de Broglie's mechanics. But we also know that there are sta uh, steady states. So there's steady walking states, there are periodic states, um, in which the driving and the dissipation balance in our system. So we can imagine that there might be some inviscid-like description, some Hamiltonian-like description of our system. So let's imagine, let's look at the system and pretend we don't know that it's driven and dissipative. What would we infer for the mass of the walker? Well, we don't expect it to be exactly the mass of the drop because it's dressed in this wave field. And for that matter, what trajectory equation would we infer? Okay, so if you look at the uh, limit of weak droplet acceleration, 
you get the following uh, equation. So basically, you do an asymptotic expansion of the uh, wave force. And it contributes to two, to two terms on the left-hand side. So basically, this is some classical potential, but the wave force is giving rise to basically a, something equivalent to a boost factor. So it's, there's an added mass associated with the wave field. Um, <clears throat> and there's also a nonlinear drag, which always drives the walker towards its free walking speed. Okay? So this is the free walking speed here. If it's moving at that speed, then the drag goes to zero. In that limit, which is the case when you have steady walking or circular motion, uh, you get the inviscid mechanics of a particle whose mass depends on its speed, okay, which is, looks, of course, like relativity. Okay, so let's use this now. So this is an experiment in which a drop approaches a submerged pillar. You expect it just to scatter, but it doesn't scatter. It scatters, but in a very strange way. So it actually follows a logarithmic spiral. Okay? And so it turns out, <clears throat> so of course, the only reason the the drop is being deflected is because its pilot wave is being distorted by this object. But let's, let's again follow this conceit where we say, ah, oh, we don't know it's a driven dissipative pilot wave system. Let's just infer the effective force required to cause this walker to move along this logarithmic spiral. And let's imagine that that force is generated by this pillar. Okay? So what is that force? We can infer it and it takes the form uh, so we use our boost equation. Again, we can use it because the thing happens to be moving at uniform speed. Uh, so we're justified in doing this, and we infer this lift force. So it's a force which is proportional to the, its velocity times uh, cross with its in, uh, instantaneous angular velocity around the post. So if we use this analog between, again, the Coriolis force and the Lorentz force that we saw before, you can see that this, this looks like a uh, an example of self-induction. So it's like a charge feeling the magnetic field associated with its own current. Okay? So <clears throat> this, and, and more importantly, so this is still puzzling me, and I think there's something very deep there. I've been puzzling it over, over it for years, as Darren knows, when we first saw this. Um, but um, you can see how this wave-mediated force gives rise to spooky action at a distance, right? If you don't know that there's a wave field, you're going to infer a non-local force, okay? All right, so here's another example. So Friedel oscillations is something that arises in quantum mechanics if you have an impurity, again, in your electron C. You have electrons zipping around on the surface of a metal. So we have a localized uh, disturbance there, and they basically solve this with scattering theory, and this is uh, effectively the de Bray wavelength in their system. Um, and so let's try it in ours. So now we're going to operate in shallow water. Turns out these things, will, so these can, things can walk in like half a millimeter. And we have here a deep well, OK? So that's a region of high excitability. It turns out these things spiral in towards the well. And as they exit the well, their speed is modulated. Okay? So if we let the thing run and run and run, these are actually experiments. So the drop is attracted towards the well. Uh, waves are excited in the well, and the waves modulate its speed. So I, I noted before there's this tendency for the drop to oscillate in speed uh, along its direction of motion with the uh, Faraday wavelength. So this is a sort of roots of a statistical signature with the Faraday wavelength. Okay, and so you see then the, uh, this is our, the speed map um, ha consists of concentric circles. And of course, that gives rise to a PDF, which looks very much like that in uh, the analog quantum problem. The wavelength here is, of course, the Faraday wavelength. Okay? So once again, we can conclude that uh, the Friedel oscillations, which is the quantum phenomenon, are, it's not, these are not inconsistent with the notion of particle trajectories. Okay, so we're kind of building up this um, class of analogs. Um, and you know, some of them are quantitative, such as the ones in the Crow and the Friedel oscillation. Some of them are more qualitative. Um, and of course, there are limitations because this is a hydrodynamic system. And we, of course, expect it to be quite different from that in quantum mechanics. Uh, so there are significant, difference, uh, sorry, significant differences. So measurement process is not intrusive. Um, details of the wave behavior are different. Um, Spin states are unstable in our system, but this should just invite us to look at a more generalized class of pilot wave theories. So if we, for example, if we take our stroboscopic model and we non-dimensionalize it, they're just two-dimensionalist groups, 
one basically prescribes the amplitude of the waves, and this is the particle inertia relative to the waves. And so we can ask, so it turns out that this parameter is limited between 0.6 and 1.4 in the experiments. What happens if it's 10 to the minus 6? What happens if it's 10 to the 16? <clears throat> it turns out if we, if we set this to 0, actually, uh, or even make it, say, half its, uh, the value we see in the lab, you can stabilize spin states, which is a drop zipping around in its own wave field. Okay? And so we're free to explore this generalized pilot wave framework and ask, and ask which quantum features can we uh, capture in which regions of parameter space. And really what we're seeing is the quantum limit is small particle inertia, if not zero. And notice if you go to small particle inertia, you go to the de Broglie limit, where you have gradient-driven motion, and then large wave amplitude. Okay, and so there are further extensions. You can change the form of the waves, of course, which you'd have to do if you went to 3D. Um, you can add a stochastic forcing, but that would seem cheating to me. And so we're basically just developing this uh, growing catalog of quantum uh, analogs and, um, and trying to make connections with the quantum mechanics. And again, I think a very interesting direction. So these are, these are spin lattices, and this works very nicely. You get transitions, which you can prompt by rotation. Um, quantitative comparisons with the equations of stochastic electrodynamics the Lorentz Dirac equation, which is a charge moving its own field. So trying to see what, what the origins of the shortcomings of those um, uh, trajectory equations might be. And most exciting for me right now is we're now looking at what we call high dynamic quantum field theory. So this is revisiting de Bray's mechanics informed by the high dynamic system. Okay, so we're basically doing now what de Bray would have done if he'd had MATLAB. Okay, so he said Klein Gordon. <clears throat> so Klein Gordon is nice, it just has a it has a resonance in it, which is the Compton frequency. And so you have a particle which is exciting at that frequency, you're gonna generate a pilot wave. Okay. So it's really very much like a system. We treat a particle as a perturbation at the resonant frequency of the equation, localized, and <clears throat> we look at gradient driven motion, as was suggested by De Bray. And when you do this, the thing spontaneously starts moving in a straight line at p equals h bar k, okay? So if nothing else, I feel that we understand the free particle in quantum mechanics. Because when you study the free particle in quantum mechanics, this is their treatment, p equals h bar k. So now we see if you treat a particle as an oscillation in a field, you get that for free. And moreover, the particle actually oscillates about that mean speed. So that's its mean speed. It's oscillating at the Compton frequency at the de Broglie wavelength. So that gives you then a mechanism for a statistical signature with the de Broglie wavelength. As we saw in our Corral experiments and various others, the Friedel oscillations, you have oscillations with the wavelength of the pilot wave that will give rise to statistics, okay? And so, moreover, this, so we're just getting started here. Notice, by the way, if you have this, these oscillations with the de Broglie wavelength, then if they're, you have circular orbits, they have to satisfy the Bohr-Sommerfeld condition. So we're just warming up here, uh, but there's much to be done. And again, I think this, this sort of dynamics uh, suggests that the uncertainty relations are really indicative of an unresolved dynamics on the Compton scale, which is the scale of these fast oscillations. Okay, and so <clears throat> the, the question which is normally uh, asked of me, so I've, I've decided to be preemptive, is um, what about Bell's theorem? So, Bell derived an inequality, which people interpret as saying there can be no um, hidden variable theory. So closer inspection uh, suggests that this doesn't have any bearing on um, systems in which particles interact with the background field. Okay? And I think more importantly, so even if you don't believe that, Bell himself, who derived his inequality and saw it violated by the experiments of Alain Aspect, came to the conclusion that there must be some pilot wave dynamics underlying quantum mechanics, and he sort of sided with the Bohmium interpretation, which I haven't had time for, but that has problems in that it has this non-local potential, and we're beginning to see in our system how you can get around that. So really, we're trying to rationalize quantum non-locality via local hereditary dynamics, and so avert the need for spooky action at a distance. So these are just examples of, how, of where you could misinfer non quantum non-locality uh, from, this, from our system, so for example, wave function collapse. If we insisted that this was a complete 
description of our physical uh, <coughs> of our physical system, then the act of observation, which would reveal the drop to be at one particular point, would cause this wave function to collapse instantaneously to a point. Okay, that's a bit trivial, but here we've seen how action at a distance can be inferred if you uh, deny the fact that there's a pilot wave. Likewise, we've looked at the slit and double slit experiments. So it turns out that in the double slit, the drop will feel the second slit by virtue of its spatially extended uh, pilot wave. And we've seen this mean pilot wave potential, which is effectively a non-local potential. <coughs> and also, Andre Nashbin has looked at dro uh, these drops interacting, these are done numerically, uh, through a sort of resonant uh, cavity. So these drops talk to each other by virtue of their common wave field, so they can become either perfectly synchronized or uh, chaotic, but with identical statistical signatures. So we're, we're now looking at uh, entanglement measures in hydrodynamic quantum analog. So to conclude, we've seen that this system provides a means to uh, explore the boundaries between classical and quantum systems, and it certainly extends the range of classical mechanics to include systems which have statistical behavior reminiscent of quantum systems. And we see really how hereditary uh, mechanics can give rise to apparently non-local behavior. Okay, and again, we've seen the very close connection with De Breuil's mechanics, and we're now developing a hydrodynamic quantum field theory informed by this hydrodynamic system. And for those doubters out there, um, I, I, I'm often, of course, we're going to have the question period over drinks, which will make it much more civil, I'm sure. But um, uh, people say, well, these paradoxes have been around for a century. What makes you think they'll ever be resolved? And I think it's worth reminding people of the paradoxes in fluid mechanics. So D'Alembert's paradox stood for 150 years until the resolution of the viscous boundary layer by Prantl. Okay. And this walking droplet system, for me, suggests that there's an unresolved dynamics on the Compton scale, resolution of which will put spade to the quantum paradoxes. Okay, so I wanted to thank all of my research group. I now, there are people working on this all over the place. Um, and of course, I wanted to thank in particular Yves Couder, who sadly passed just a couple of months ago. Uh, he was a brilliant man and a wonderful, wonderful scientist. So thank you all for your attention. <laughs>